Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of From Page to Stage. I'm your host Wendy Corner and this podcast is for you if you were an author. Now what do I mean by an author? Well there's the obvious solo book, there's a contributory book. If you're an entrepreneur I would suggest you are an author because you may have a blog but you'll certainly have socials and what's that if it's not published work? That may have changed your ideas a bit. But what about the stage thing? Because this is for page and stage. Not everybody gets up on a physical stage with a microphone in hand. Some people get very nervous about that. But if you can do a one-on-one conversation, kind of like we're doing now. (laughs) Hello, it's called a podcast. And that is a stage. So Whether you've done page and stage, whether you've done the page or are working your way towards the page and maybe not quite the stage yet, you're welcome. You're in the right place. And I have a wonderful guest for you today. Joel Salomon, who's based in New York, who's done both page and stage a fair few times. So he's here to drop some stellar information for us. Now, I could go a little bit further into Joel's introduction but you know what he knows himself better than I do handball Joel tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are now thank you Wendy first of all for having me on the show and uh, it's very much an honor and pleasure to be here so thank you for having me thank you so yes I am currently I call myself a master prosperity coach and I teach people how to change their beliefs around money from thoughts like, I can't afford that. Money doesn't grow on trees. That's too expensive. At least that's how I grew up. Mm -hmm. My dad used to tell me, Joel, we're not a shareholder of Long Island Lighting Company. Shut that light off. So I I used to get that. I used to get, were you born in a barn? Close the door. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So I call all of that thoughts of scarcity, lack, poverty consciousness, and I teach the opposite. I teach prosperity, abundance, and you came here to thrive, not survive. Now, what's also quite unique about me is I also teach money manifestation techniques and investing. I teach investing in stocks or real estate or reinvesting in your business. Now, I'm a former hedge fund manager. I shut down my hedge fund, Solomore Capital, which is the name of my company still now, named after my daughters, Lauren and Morgan. So I started my own hedge fund, which if you ask me before you were born, Wendy, in 1993, Joel, what's your dream? I would have said hedge fund manager. I was working as an actuary. Mm -hmm. And Wendy, you may know the difference between an actuary and an accountant. An actuary looks at his feet when he talks to you. An accountant looks at your feet when they talk to you. (laughs) Love it. Yeah, they, they say an actuary is an accountant with charisma. But I'm not the typical actuary, and I did go through all the exams. FSA stands for Fellow of the Society of Actuaries. And I was working as an actuary coding, and I really didn't like my day job. But in the evenings, in the evenings, I was analyzing stocks and finding some good ideas. And I really enjoyed my evenings and weekends doing that. So I figured, wow, if I could align my hobby and my career, it wouldn't be work. It would be fun. And so I went out and asked a number of people who were working on Wall Street, had they get there, would they do? And everyone told me, forget it. Total rejection. A lot of doubt. Mm -hmm. They said, Joel, you're an actuary. Forget it. You don't have the experience. You don't have the background. You don't have the education. Just forget it. Be an actuary. Until I found one person after many, many, many calls who gave me his path. And I followed it mostly. And 15 years later, I was working at City in Manhattan as a hedge fund manager. In 2008, I got hired. 
And Wendy, you may remember 2008 was not the best year in the stock market. I did manage to make a little bit of money that year, made more money the next year, and might actually today still be doing that job at Citi, but there was a law passed that said banks can't own hedge funds. And so all of us were laid off, which actually gave me the kick in the butt to create my own company, mm. which was my true dream. And so in 2013, I launched Solomore Capital, a hedge fund betting that some stocks were going to go up, other stocks were going to go down, and only focused on financial companies. That was my background, mostly investing in banks and insurance companies. And now I might still be doing that today, except for a really interesting experience I had. I went to a personal development course in December of 2015, and there was a guy there pitching stocks and stock options as the only way to get rich. He said, you don't need much time. You don't need much money. This is how the rich people get rich, and options are essentially risk-free. And I was sick to my stomach. It was day two of the conference. I had people tapping me on the shoulder, whispering me, Joel, does this make sense? Are options really risk-free? So after he was done, we went out of the auditorium. I told him, please don't do this. He has no idea about any of you individually. And most importantly, no idea about your belief that you could become rich using options. I went home that night. I couldn't sleep. 3.30 in the morning, it hit me. I couldn't get the guy out of my head. And I realized if I could ever get up the courage to stand on a stage in front of 200 people, see, my biggest fear in life that day was public speaking. Mm -hmm. I could be authentic, tell people the truth about money and be of service. Yeah. And what did I do? I jumped out of bed. I quickly got dressed. I was in my office in Midtown Manhattan before the sun rose. And I sent an email to my investors telling them I'm giving them their money back. I'm shutting down my fund. I figured out my true purpose in life mm -hmm. to help you become financially free to teach you the truth about money, to learn and have you learn that there are a thousand different ways to become rich. Belief is critical. And I want everyone to know that they can, and it's good to become rich. And so I'm on a journey right now to help at least 100,000 people become financially free. Fabulous. Isn't it amazing how certain events that at the time were not welcome, when you look back on them, you go, yeah, actually, I needed that. And it was pivotal in moving me forward. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, so yeah, that's so how... Go on. I was just going to, sorry to interrupt, Wendy. I was going to say that I ask my clients, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well as I have a membership. I ask people in my membership, people one-on-one -on -one coaching, what's the gift in the challenge? Mm. What's the yeah. gift in the challenge? Yeah. Because in every challenge, and it may be really hard to see it in the midst of it. If you had asked me in 2007, when I was going through a very difficult divorce, Joel, what's your gift in the challenge? I would have probably punched you in the face. Yes. But looking back now, there are so many gifts, right? And mm -hmm. so if you can step back, I believe that in every challenge, there is a gift. Yeah. Somebody once said to me, sometimes your gifts come wrapped in sandpaper. Exactly. Thought, oh, yeah. That, that That's just so beautifully, literally encapsulated. It hurts at the time, but... Once it's over, then you can see, yeah, I needed to do that. Yeah, cool. Okay, so that's where you are now. One, obviously, this, this podcast is about from page to stage. So I'm going to ask you, how long have you been writing? What prompted you to start writing? And by writing, I don't necessarily mean the stuff that got published. Some of, some of our guests have been writing since they were seven. So I'm, I'm just going to ask you, Go back in time. When when can you remember that you got involved in writing and enjoyed it? Good question. 
I mean, obviously during school you had to write papers. I didn't love it. I will tell you, you know, I, I was not the, I, I was a math and statistics major in college and university. So if I had to, I was required to take one English class and I took one English class and I wrote one for one semester. So it was not a love. And I also knew that I needed to, throughout my career, communicate. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, when I was an analyst at a small hedge fund, I would write up every idea, every stock investment idea that I recommended in detail, because I thought that that would be more likely to get it invested in if mm -hmm. I had all the background rather than talking about it for a few minutes. So I documented a lot of my research. And even before that, when I was a credit analyst at a Swiss company and also at Moody's, when I was, I worked at Moody's, a credit rating agency here in the States. It's actually a global credit rating agency that sets um, ratings and the bond ratings and insurance financial strength ratings. And so I took it upon myself when I was a junior analyst to write research and, and hope that it would get published okay. because it would make me more likely to get promoted. And so I took uh, upon myself some different types of topics and I did get a number of those research reports published. And then of course, we public, Moody's publicly published opinions on the insurance companies that I was rating when I got promoted. Mm -hmm. And so these were five to 10, 15 page reports on the analysis of the company's management team, the analysis of their profitability, their capital strength, their reserve strength, and asset liability management. So it was a very dense piece of work that we had to do, we were required to do to tell the public why we were rating the company, what we were rating it. So yes, I got into, I remember that I didn't love that writing. It was required and there were, yeah. you know, sections. And so, but I've, the, the reason why I wrote my books, if you ask that question is, well, my first book after I shut down my hedge fund, I knew that I needed to get out there, be more visible as a prosperity coach to help people become financially free. And I realized that I'd written every month to my investors as a hedge fund manager for 36 months, 10 pages. I had a 360 page book. And I reached out to my lawyer who for my hedge fund who told me I probably should not put my top idea in this book for each month for the that's what i was doing to my investors telling them about my top idea so i took that out so it was a little bit shorter and then i figured out i'll write a little bit about each month that i was managing money from 2013 to 2016 and i sent it it was a paragraph or a page in front of each month and then i had the monthly quote unquote investor letter and I sent it out to a lot of friends and family members, and I got consensus. Please don't show this to anyone else. It is the worst piece of crap I've ever seen in my life. Oh, thanks for the feedback, guys. It was consensus. Please, oh, no one's going to read this. It is worthless poppycock. Mm -hmm. And so I did get some constructive criticism from a yep. best-selling author who told me that if I take the investor letters and put it in the appendix and then write more on that paragraph or page that I wrote each month, that was good stuff. And so I took her advice to heart and I started writing and, and, and embellishing and enhancing those paragraphs at the start of each month. And, and then I sent it off to her again in the summer of 2017. And she said to me, this is closer, but I would recommend taking those investor letters, 
and taking them out of the book. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's hey. the book, though. <laughs> so she said, why don't you just meditate on it for a few weeks? And I did. And I realized that the only reason I was keeping them in is because it was an easy way to have my book be completed. And it wasn't really serving others. Mm -hmm. And so I took them out and I had to write all the summer of 2017 uh, a book. <laughs> and so I wrote what became Mindful Money Management, which was a memoir of my days as a hedge fund manager from a personal point of view and dealing with the ups and downs of and the volatility of the stock market and also some personal stories and that became a bestseller and somebody who read it said to me, so this book has a lot of great advice in it. Did, have you ever thought about writing a rule book that can help people become rich? And I was like, that's easy. The, the, the rules are in there already. I just have to pull them out. Maybe there was two or three. And that became the nine money rules millionaires use my second bestseller from 2019. Cool. But you have the third one as well. I do. Uh, the third book is called Infinite Love and Money. And that is an interesting book. So I, I jog a lot. And one morning I was jogging. It was actually in 2019. And I was coaching this guy to help him get his dream job. It was a unique coaching experience for me and for him. He was a, I was a former client of his. He was working at an investment bank and he was not happy. And I told him I could help him pull himself out of the situation and get towards his dream job because I'd love to help people achieve their dream jobs. And so we started working together. And one day I, we were talking about cash flow and he said, well, I really need to share with you all the information. I said, yeah, the next call, you should get your wife on so that we can both, all three of us discuss your cash flow situation. He's like, Joel, my wife does not get involved in money situations, anything to do with the money. I control the budget. I control the purse strings and she doesn't need to know any of this. I will tell her. And I got off that call and I was like, man, that's not good. So I was jogging the next morning and I realized, oh my God, this is a really important book that needs to get out there because the number one reason why marriages, relationships fail is money. Yeah. So I reached out to a relationship coach who is also an infinite possibilities trainer. And we, uh, Molly Singh and I started writing Infinite Love and Money and the purpose is to end divorce caused by money. Love it. Love it. So all three books have had a very powerful intention behind them, haven't they? Yes. Yeah. Very powerful purpose. Thank you for sharing that. Because I, I love to dig into what prompted people to start writing in the first place. And usually there's been something significant. Yes. And can I tease the, oh, the viewers and listeners a little bit? You've so, got something else working on at the moment. Yes. So next year, uh -huh. early 2025, will, will be my fourth book. Mm -hmm. And it's called Purpose and Prosperity. And I'm writing it with a per, actually we're finished writing. We're into the editing and, okay. and uh, production stage of the book. Mm -hmm. And oh, so- Does that mean, does that not mean you could get it out before 2025? It's possible. We'll see. I don't, we don't, I don't, I, I am all about divine timing. And, yeah. you know, you, you know, the book, production process so mm -hmm. it normally once you're completed it takes three to six months so it could get done in 2024 if we rush a little bit but i prefer not to yeah. anyway I'm, we're working so the purpose of this book purpose and prosperity is to teach people that you can and i fully believe the world needs to know this and hear this that you can do your purpose on earth and be massively profitable and massively prosperous. Mm -hmm. And 
and I'm an example of that. I, my dream was to be a hedge fund manager. I, I achieved that dream and became very prosperous doing it. I'm now helping people become financially free. And I've had some really very prosperous years doing this. Mm -hmm. And so it's overcoming the stigma of the starving artist. And that's a limiting belief, right? Well, mm -hmm. if I'm a writer or if I'm a singer or if I'm an actor or if I'm a painter or sculptor that I'm gonna starve. Mm -hmm. And that's a massive limiting belief. I will tell you there are hundreds of thousands if not millions of people who are doing those things making millions and millions and millions and they're very prosperous. And somebody said to me, yes, but the probability of that happening is quite low. And I will tell you, if you go into corporate and you work at Amazon or Google or Facebook, that your probability of making millions there is infinitesimally small. It's the same probability. Mm -hmm. But we've been taught that if you do these other things, that it's harder. It's only harder when you believe it's harder. Yes. I've got a wonderful example of that. One of the, the people I knew very well at university, she was doing um, a course in optometry. So she became an optician for 30 odd years, had a couple of um, practices, was doing really well, but her heart wasn't in it. And when she was going through school, she was a phenomenal artist, but she had drummed into her, if you want to be successful, you must have a proper job. Almost like a mantra. If you want to be successful, you must have a proper job. You know, almost in in, in the, the the sort of Asian parameters of doctor, lawyer, teacher, and engineer, that sort of thing. After about thirty years, she decided to sell her practices. She's done a fine arts degree, and she locums back in the one of the practices that she she sold. So she does still have a little bit of money coming in, but she's loving life. She's creating so much wonderful work. I don't think I've seen her happier, I'll be honest. So uh, right. yeah, the, the creative, it, it, it's like you don't have to be only a speaker or an author. It's not an either or. And as you're saying with being a creative, you don't have to be a creative and poor, unless you tell yourself, yeah. Absolutely, so rule number three in the nine money rules millionaires use is can happiness buy me money? Not can so money again? buy me, can happiness buy me money? Not can money buy me happiness, can happiness buy me money? So I will tell you that she is creating abundance by being happier. And what I teach in the book is write down some of your happy habits. What floats your boat? What really makes you happy? Mm -hmm. And usually it's not things that cost money. It's meditating or visualizing. You're taking a walk on a sandy beach. Maybe it's not too far. Maybe just taking a walk in nature or playing mm -hmm. with your kids or playing with your dog or cat or gardening. You know, what really is, you know, for me, playing games, playing ping pong, going for a jog, you know, reading, you know, those, how much, these don't cost any money. And mm -hmm. I believe by you being happier, you're creating more abundance and prosperity in your life. So I highly recommend writing down some happy habits. Happy habits. Love it. Love it. Okay. So that's what prompted you to start the writing. You've hinted that we've got something on the go. We'll come back to that in a minute. But tell us a bit more about your speaking journey, would you? Absolutely. You did, you did and, actually and say that you were scared stiff of it. You didn't, a bit fierty. Mm. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. I was I was meaning to bring that up as well. So you, you, you're psychic. So, and I think we all are. And so I'll just go back to... I was 12 years old. I was on stage at Encore Elementary School. It was my fifth grade play. 
And when it came time for me to say my lines, I just froze for 30 minutes. It seemed like to me, I think it was mm. 20 or 30 seconds. And finally, they skipped over me, thank God. And no one remembered those 20 or 30 seconds except for me for the next 40 years. Mm. And it became my biggest fear. Yeah. And I knew after I had written my first book, Mindful Money Management, that I probably was going to have to do this, <laughs> at least this, get on a podcast. And if you had asked me back in 2017, when I was writing the book, if you have to do that, I, I would have just said, take the gun, just, just shoot me, like, please, I'm like, put me out of my misery. No. Mm -hmm. And in October of 2016, I went to the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, to a conference called Playing the Matrix by Mike Dooley. Mm -hmm. And Mike talked, and he talked about how he started his career as an accountant. And I mentioned earlier, I started my career as an actuary. So we had that in common, both very introverted people. Mm -hmm. And here he is talking about his experience talking in front of 20, 30,000 people around the globe. And he mentioned that he joined Toastmasters, which is a group of volunteers where you get to speak in front of five or 10 or 20 or 30 people and practice. Mm -hmm. And he said the first time he got up there, he took his note cards and he was shaking his piece of paper like this. And, and every time he said a filler word, like um or ah, uh, or you know, they rang a bell. And this woman was bing, 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 throughout his speech. And even when he'd stopped speaking, she was dinging. And he... <laughs> so I heard this and I was, I said to myself, if he is where he is now, and I am where he was. I can get to where he is now, eventually. Mm -hmm. He's no different than I am. And so I researched, after that Playing the Matrix conference, I researched Toastmasters in Manhattan, and I found one that had space to speak in starting in January of 2017 in Midtown Manhattan. And I started speaking once a week. I remember the first speech I gave, it's called the icebreaker. And I had to speak for four to six minutes about myself, which was mm -hmm. the most difficult. And I got up there with my note cards. And at the end, they said to me, in the so they evaluate each speech each yes. week and there's usually three of them so they evaluated me and the guy who came up to evaluate me said joel at toastmasters we don't use index cards so your next speech will not be with index cards i would my, you should have seen my i'm like what i i should i come back i don't know but there was so much positive feedback and applause and there was such a supportive group of people that I decided to come back and practice a speech that I had to give three months later. Didn't have to, but I chose to, which was so, which was at my daughter Lauren's bat mitzvah in mm -hmm. on March 4th of 2017. So my company name Sa Lauren Moore, Lauren, uh, it's named after Lauren and Morgan. So so Laura for Lauren and I gave that second speech. I asked them if I could give a little bit longer speech that I had been practicing. And they said, sure. And so I practiced Lauren's bat mitzvah speech in front of Toastmasters. And I got really positive feedback because I was able a couple of weeks later to practice it a hundred times and then do it in front of them without my index cards, which was a huge win for me. And no, ding, and ding, 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 ding. I, I didn't get the ding ding. Well, I did get a lot of those. <laughs> and the president of Toastmasters came up 
to me afterwards and said, Joel, great speech. He wasn't the evaluator. He said, great speech and a way to make it even better is to have a theme. Because Toastmasters speeches have themes. And your theme was, my daughter's great and I love her. And think about the kids in the audience. They're hearing, they're going to a lot of bat mitzvahs. And they're hearing the same thing from the parents every week. I love my daughter. She's awesome. What about having a theme? And so I created a theme for my daughter, which was she is an awesome manifester. And she is and continues to be to this day. And I give examples from her age three to 13 about how she had manifested her life, getting up on stages. She's the opposite of me, by the way. She's been singing and dancing and acting since she was five. Mm -hmm. and, and I gave a speech about her manifestation techniques and her getting on stage in Universal Studios and at Hershey Park and all these different mm -hmm. Disney World, all these places that we had gone to. And with a theme running through it about manifestation and the kids loved it. And in fact, apparently two or three of her friends came up to her on the Monday morning uh, of after the bat mitzvah and actually made a comment about her dad's speech, which was just like, what? <laughs> oh, precious, precious. Wow. So I've been practicing. I will tell you, I practiced that speech 150 times mm -hmm. over and over again and memorized it. Mm -hmm. And for, for 2017, 2018, even into 2019 speeches, I would practice over and over and over again until I had memorized every single word. As uh, I didn't mention in, in the introduction, but I have done a TEDx speech last year as well called How to Create Money Miracles. Love uh, for people to watch it. Obviously it's free. It has two powerful techniques to create money miracles. And I was able to do that speech. Not Now the TEDx speeches you have to memorize within a certain parameter. So you can't go off on tangents. You have to literally send in your speech and they check. So that speech was very close to memorized. I did go off on a couple of slight tangents, a couple of sentences. But nowadays, after having gone to Toastmasters for over two, two plus years, given over 100 speeches there, and having been on over 100 podcasts in the last four years, I don't need to memorize every single presentation I give. Well, the thing is, once you've got your signature talk down pat, you you adapt it for the audience. But right. um, there are, from my perspective, and, and this is this, this is where I'll come in and do a bit of me for a minute. There are two two ways of doing it. There are for for the analytical folks like yourself that feel as though they have to write it all out first and then memorize it. I say to them, well, yes, okay, do that. And know it so well that he, you're not reading it. You're not memorizing it from a script because it uses a certain part of your brain that kind of bypasses the heart, which is yes. really not a good move. So you need to know it so well that you can then embody those words literally in your body. Other people will do the, I'm, I don't need to rehearse, I'm downloading. And I'm going, yes, I understand you're going with the flow. But like a river, and they go, oh, yes, absolutely. I said, well, the, the river also has banks. So you need to have your banks through which to flow. Because if you don't have those banks, you don't have a flow direction, then the water overflows, it gets muddy and miry, and you get stuck in the mud, and I can guarantee your audience will as well. So yes. some people like to do the spontaneous stuff, but I still recommend that you have a very clear parameter of where you're going. I agree. Mm, yes. I, I, and I will tell you, Mike Dooley, who has spoken in front of thousands of people, tells me he still practices mm -hmm. before he gives a, a conference or a course. And I would highly recommend still practicing 
you're if you're giving a keynote or yes. you're giving more than a 10 or 15 20 minute and it's not an interview then yeah. have you know practice and i i will i still practice i'm i'm now speaking internationally i'm doing a speech in portugal next year and i'm i'm speaking around the us and practice 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 oh, practice absolutely my, my thoughts are sort of jordan uh, michael jordan style until you can't get it wrong. Um, yeah. I mean, there'll be, there'll be certain phrases that you, you and, and I've got memory tools and, and tips that I, that I share with people, but you're right. It, giving yourself permission to, and the time to rehearse. You were saying about doing TEDx. I had one of the speakers, audience, if you were unaware, I was the head TEDx coach for University of Western Australia for five years. And we had one of our speakers who's a professional voice user, goes out in front of the, the high court. No problem. You get her on a red circle, on dress rehearsal, freezes. Why is it? I said, well, because when you're in the high court, yes, it's a stressful situation, but you have prepared very carefully a brief about somebody else. This is you bearing your soul. It's a very different matter. So, yeah, it, it really does take courage and rehearsal. Absolutely. Shed loads of both, yeah. So you, you, you did your TEDx in 23? Yes, 20. Well, the inside scoop is I've actually got, I got approved at two different venues, and I one of them did not actually go live. So, okay. yes. Right. So, so the one I, I that in April of 2023 that went live is in Cole Park, Texas. Okay. And again, that speech is called How to Create Money Miracles. Audience, we do dynamic show notes on this on this this podcast. So we will have the links to Joel's TEDx as well as his author page for Amazon so that you can go and check out all his wonderful written published book work we will also have his links to his podcast his um website and, and all the things that you can catch up with him there now the other thing that i mentioned dynamic show notes is that when new book comes out i get authors to tell me oh by the way such and such is coming out and i go back and change the show notes and put out a quick social going do you remember that brilliant conversation I had with Joel Salmon? Well, he's got another thing coming out. Nice. You've got another book coming out, then we'll probably have you back in on the show as well. Again, hence me asking, when are you planning on it? Because as you know, you've got to give at least a month's run in on the podcasts because not every host will interview you and deliver it that week. Sometimes they've got a good lag. I've, I recorded one Oh, last week that's likely to come out until the beginning of October. So yes, I actually thinking about it. similar. I got on a podcast in April and the woman, I, she said, is there anything you have coming up? And I said, yes, I'm teaching a nine week course based on the nine money rules millionaires use October 1st. Can we make sure? And she said, oh, I don't know. And that was April. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so she's working to get that out in September. <laughs> I mean, that audience, just just a bit of an inside information because some of you lovely people watching this are going to come on as guests from the page to stage. What I also put in the application form is, do you have a time sensitive date so that we try and get you out just ahead of whatever it is that you're you're announcing, so that it's still fresh in people's minds and they go right. I'm going to go and do that now. So again, the art of knowing how to get onto your different podcasts and what's involved. Excellent. Beautiful. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, if, I so, could, if I could share just mm -hmm. one, a couple of free things. Sure, yeah. One is on September 24th, 7.30 Eastern Time, 4.30 Pacific. I know it's a little late uh, for the UK. It'd be 12.30 uh, BCT. But we're, I'm doing a free masterclass based on my TEDx called How to Create Money Miracles. 
it's going to go deeper, much deeper. It's an hour long. My TEDx is only 11 minutes. It's going to go much deeper into a couple, the couple of techniques and more on how to create money miracles. And anyone who's watching, I will give you 30 minutes free of prosperity coaching. Just go to solomore.com and sign up. Absolutely free. Uh, we'll just, just find some time on my calendar and there's no obligation to do anything else. My dream is to have you move closer to financial freedom in those 30 minutes and maybe you get a tip or two that you can use for your life. Thank you so much, Joel. That's very generous of you. If people can't make that that live call, is there going to be a recording that we could yes. sign up to? Great, great. Because as you're you're right, you, you can never have everybody up across the world. Right. So sign up, you know, with the the link mm-hmm. and and you you'll get you have to sign up to you have to register in advance for sure. it. But once you do that, then you'll get the recording and you'll get the handout as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Again. That will be in the show notes, guys. So do do check that out and register for that wonderful webinar. Okay, so we've worked out what prompted you to start writing. We've had a bit more about your journey in the speaking. We know that you've got this new book coming out soon, in the next probably in the next six months. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm going to ask you now: How do you embody your words? when you take them from page to stage? Hmm. Well, I think what's most important is to show people how to become financially free, how to move from, you know, what's what's on the paper to then put it into practice. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I guess it's two things. One, you know, it's like, what can you do to move towards financial freedom? And then when you're speaking it, to really get people engaged by making it interactive. You know, when when you're writing, I find, I mean, actually, in Infinite Love and Money, we made it interactive. So it's 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 an exercise book for you and a partner you and your partner to go together. Most books are not that way, right? My yeah. first two books were not that way. So you're actually talking to the reader and hoping mm-hmm. that they're going to do an exercise. Whereas mm-hmm. when I'm speaking in a podcast or I'm speaking in my courses, I I have people do things. So yeah. for example, here's one technique to use. What can you do to act as if you are already prosperous, Mm. right? So most people in life, it's, you have to, they feel like they have to do, 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 and then they have. Mm -hmm. I recommend being, then doing, then having. So how can you be abundant? How can you be prosperous? When you're prosperous and abundant, you're free. So what actions can you take to act as if you're free on a daily basis? Maybe you spend an hour just for yourself on self-care. That will get you into the mindset of, wow, I am free. I I am taking control of my hour Mm -hmm. in the beginning of the day, and I am moving towards financial freedom, right? What baby steps can you take? Maybe you could go online and check out Weta Wayata. And, and you can check out like a beautiful hotel there. What are the activities to do? What are the excursions? Mm. You know, what other places can you, and how much would it, how many frequent fly miles would it take? What's the best time of year to go? Uh, maybe you just check out how much it is to go to first class to Puerto Vallarta. Mm-hmm. So you're acting as if you're, you're being you're embodying the prosperity first before actually taking the action, right? And so being, so when I'm speaking, it's more about interaction, mm-hmm. whereas usually in writing, it's it's less interaction and more mm-hmm. hoping that the, the reader will take action. 
So what I'm hearing from you is when you are speaking, you are literally living, embodying your words that you've written down. And the encouragement, the invitation is for your audience to go, let's start implementing this. Yes, implementation. It, it, Be, it, being now. Ooh, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Because that, that's the thing, isn't it? Because the, the, there's so much concept. We can we can do the concept, and again, you and I are both from a cerebral background, but it's not if it stays up there and isn't actually acted on, and become as you say, it becomes you. You become it. Then it doesn't do anything at all. It just stays in the head. Right. And here's a really powerful technique to do today. Check, check your actions that you that you're doing in the next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. How are your actions a tell on whether you're thinking in a prosperous way or a poverty conscious way? Are you going to get some petrol today and only putting five pounds in? Or are you filling up the tank? Mm. Are you brushing your teeth? and taking a wooden board and rolling it forward on the toothpaste so that you don't miss a drop of toothpaste. Is that prosperous thinking or poverty thinking? Mm. Are you doing what my dad told me to do, which is reaching for the light every time you leave a room, even if you're leaving for 10 or 20 or 30 minutes because you're want to save that extra penny or pound is that now if you knew that there was almost an infinite amount of abundance on this on this earth which there is it's almost 500 trillion us dollars if you knew that and you knew that you were a, the your fair share was available to you at all times mm -hmm. then you would you be pulling for that that cord on the light bulb So actions are a really big tell on and, and it's, your it's, thoughts and beliefs. Exactly. And, and it's the actions that, that sometimes the actions come from, the same action can come from either direction. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm mentioning this because I do have the door shut at the moment, not to try and keep the, the heat in type thing, because it's not that warm here. <laughs> But it's also because I'm in a, in somebody else's house and I'm closing the door so I don't disturb them. Yes. Yeah, so the reason behind the action is very important. Mm. Like two people can do the exact same action. Yeah. And and one is from a poverty conscious or a scarcity mindset and the other is from an abundance mindset or, or it may not be related at all to abundance or scarcity. Yeah, be quite neutral. That that's the thing, isn't it? it? It's digging into the motives. It's digging into the intention behind it. Back to what I talk about, which is the internal scripts. What are the things you're telling yourself? You were saying about do, doing your international speaking. Well, last week I was speaking at Cambridge University. Oh, it's nearly two weeks ago now, and I was talking about my life with twenty kilos. Shameless plug, I'm working on a book at the moment under that title. And I was talking about how I have moved from a family of hoarders, having married into a family of hoarders, having to go from three houses, because everything turned up in my house, down to 30 boxes to emigrate to Australia. And now I'm surviving. Am I thriving? I'm certainly enjoying living literally with 20 kilos in my suitcase but what's been more important is not only letting go of the stuff it's been the mental baggage yeah that has been so powerful in my journey yeah. hoarding is a topic that we address in infinite love and money and we created seven money personality types and the acronym is sugar pie. If you're from the South, you're in the US, uh, you may have had a sugar pie. 
So S is for splurgers, U is for the unconscious one, G is for greedy. Now these are provocative uh, personality types. A is for the accumulator. And then we go pi, P is for the protectionist. I is for the investor, E is for the egotist. So the protectionist is the hoarder. Yeah. It's the one who does, and, and, and people have this misperception that that's good. You know, let's protect our money Let's put it under the mattress. Let's put it in a savings account earning 0.2%. That's that's good. And I will tell you that's probably one of the worst money. Now, I don't, again, everyone has its positives and negative attributes, mm -hmm. but it's one of the worst because what we teach is that money is energy. And so you have to have it be in flow. We were talking about flow earlier, right? And so money, you want to allow it to flow. If you're this, then think about like you have a good friend, maybe a lover, and you're doing this all the time. They, they, want, to, they want to push away, right? Yeah. So this kind of energy around money is not serving you. Allowing mm -hmm. it to flow, rule number six in the nine money rules is giving, you know, giving to others, mm -hmm. uh, investing the money and, and allowing it to flow back to you. Because when you give what, you know, Sir John Templeton, one of the best investors of all time said he hadn't met anybody who hadn't given at least 10% each year mm -hmm. over a 10 year period of their earnings to charity who didn't have massively more wealth at the end of the 10 years than at the beginning. Yes. So that's by putting the money in flow. Mm -hmm. mm. It comes in, it goes out. It comes in, it goes out. Yes. Well, um, yeah, like like you, I grew up with the can't afford it, do without it, don't throw it away. It'll come in handy one day. Oh, yes. Yeah, and it's that's a uh, it's not an easy state of mentality to overcome and it can be and it, it's not serving you no right? it's by not. by saying like i may need them. my dad by the way I, you know he passed away a few years ago and i was going through the things and he had credit card receipts for the last 20 years in case just in case something someone may need that receipt i mean my father-in-law had tax returns back to 1965 he yeah, passed similar. in 2000 really yeah similar similar i, so, I even discovered how much a, a british tv license in 1971 cost for six pounds <laughs> in new money <laughs> really exciting come on yes right so so, so yeah it's really important it yeah letting go is a very important technique in life figuring out how to let go. And the other, one of my uh, final messages I would love to give to your listeners and viewers is hashtag doubt the doubt. Have faith in your dreams. Don't have mm -hmm. faith in your doubt. You know, when I wanted to be a hedge fund manager, it took me a very long time because everyone was doubting me. I told the story about everyone I talked to said, no, it's, you can't do it. You're an actuary. And finally, when I came upon that guy who gave me his path to becoming a money manager. I believed that I could do it because he did it. And so I had faith in my dream. But mm -hmm. a lot of times the starving artist, the book author or the speaker may have doubts. Like, right. can I actually make money doing this? So I will tell you, hashtag doubt the doubt. It's easier said than done, mm -hmm. but if you have questions, jump on 30 minutes with me. I'll give you techniques so that you can doubt it out. Thank you. Oh, Joel, that's been wonderful. I was about to ask before we wrap up, is there anything we've forgotten? But I think you've just shared that with us, haven't you? Lovely. Yes. Thank you so much, Joel. This has been a, a wonderful podcast, giving us so much value for sharing your from page to stage. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate you. For now, bye from us.